Hi, hello, welcome to my bookshelf tour that's taken me ages to film because I didn't know how to film it on my phone because I tried filming it all in one go and my phone wouldn't let me upload that to Dropbox. But anyway, I think I found a way around it, so bear with me. Also, sorry if you can hear my roommates in the background. I turned the fan off though, so you won't hear that. So no worries about that. Anyway, let's get started, shall we? First, we have my mythology section, which ends there. First up is the Iliad. Next, we have the Song of Achilles, my favorite book. Then we have Circe, my not-so-favorite book, which I still gave five stars on Goodreads and said it was four and a half stars. But y'all, it's only like at least four stars. Like... I need to read it again, but looking back, it's only like four stars. Then we have the Alexander the Great series by Mary Renault. The first one is called Fire from Heaven. And I have these next to Circe and the Song of Achilles, not because they're really mythology based, but because I associate Mary Renault's writing with Madeline Miller's because I've heard they're very similar. But anyway, yeah, we have the first one, Fire from Heaven. The second one is The Persian Boy. And the last one is The Funeral Games. So I have a box set of Percy Jackson and the Olympians that usually lives on my bookshelf right before the Heroes of Olympus series, but I'm currently loaning that to my roommate, so it's no longer on my bookshelf at the moment. But that's okay, because it makes way for all of these other glorious books. And so, anyway, to start things off in the Rick... Riordan section, which I guess is how I'm going to pronounce his name in this video, uh, is The Lost Hero. Next we have the second book in the Heroes of Olympus series, which is The Son of Neptune, but those are all, those are the only two that I have in the Heroes of Olympus series. <laughs> Moving on to the Trials of Apollo series, we have book one, The Hidden Oracle, book two, The Dark Prophecy, and book three, The Burning Maze, which will break your heart if you have not read it, so be warned. Finally, we have the Magnus Chase and the Gods of Asgard series, which honestly may be my favorite series by Rick Riordan. I don't know, y'all. It's just so good. And anyway, the first book in that is The Sword of Summer. The next one is The Hammer of Thor. And to round out the mythology section, we have Magnus Chase and the Gods of Asgard, The Ship of the Dead, which I went to a book tour of it, and it's signed! We'll get to these books in a hot second, but for now we're going to move them so we can get to the books behind them. The next section is the Glorious Holy Trinity minus Crooked Kingdom, because I do not own Crooked Kingdom yet, but I will soon. Comprising that is Six of Crows. Then we have the Raven Cycle, starting with the Raven Boys. Then we have the Dream Thieves. I can't decide if this one or the Raven King is actually my favorite book in the Raven Cycle, so. Next is Blue Lily, Lily Blue. And to complete the Raven Cycle is my favorite cover and possibly favorite book, the Raven King. The last member of the Holy Trinity is All for the Game, and the first book in All for the Game is The Foxhole Court. Next is uh, The Raven King. And finally, we have my favorite book in the All for the Game series, The Kingsman. Next, I have two queer books that are white and that really fit the color scheme of this bookshelf well. And I just, they're some of my favorites, so they're on the top shelf. First one is Let's Talk About Love by Claire Kahn. I love this book and it's asexual representation so much. And the next one is The Dangerous Art of Lending In, which is my favorite, probably like contemporary queer book, honestly. Uh, it's real good, y'all. I guess Aristotle and Dante is a contemporary. But is it? Because it's not set in modern times. I don't know, fam. I don't know. I just really really like this book. And now we have these books. So first we have Not Your Sidekick, which you will see in a later video. Then we have Check Please, which you will also see in a later video. Then we have All the Crooked Saints, which I've already read and did a reading vlog on. You can go check that out in the right hand corner. And finally, we have Nine from the Nine Worlds, which I've also finished. And you can check out that reading vlog in the right hand corner as well. Now, I'm not sure if I told you all this, but the first shelf has most of my favorite books, with the exception of Circe over there. The second shelf has books that I liked, but don't necessarily belong on a favorite shelf. You feel me? Although, I feel like some of these do belong a favorite on a favorite shelf, 
specifically All Out in the Way We're Children series. But there's no room up there, so they're down here. Which brings me to the sh the tour of the second shelf. They're not divided into sections like the top shelf is. It's just kind of a random mess. So anyway, we're just going to go through the books. First, we have Les Mis. Then we have All Out, which is a queer anthology of short stories of queer teens throughout the ages, as you can see on the cover. But it's so good, and it introduced me to so many new authors that I'm going to read. And it definitely belongs on the top shelf. There's just there's just no room, and I wish I could put it there, because I love it so much. Then we have Down Among the Sticks and Bones, which is the second book in the Wayward Children series, the first one being Every Heart a Doorway. Fun fact, I bought Every Heart a Doorway on Black Friday on Book Depository, so I will soon have it and have the complete series so far. Next is Beneath the Sugar Sky, which is definitely my favorite in the uh, Wayward Children series. Then we have Simon vs. the Homo Sapiens Agenda. Next, we have Leah on the Offbeat. Then we have the start of my Harry Potter books. I don't have books one and two, but I do have Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. I also have Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire and Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, and Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. And finally, we have Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, which is the only one that I own in hardback. And the only reason I own it in hardback is because somebody gave it to me, because they bought it when it first came out, and then they read it, and then they gave it to me. So, yeah. I didn't, I didn't read Harry Potter as a child. I read it in high school. And by that time, I was like, hey, can I borrow Harry Potter from you? And thus, I wound up with only year three through seven. But I think that's actually pretty good, because I, I think I went back and bought five, because I don't think I had five. Um, I think I had three, four, six, and seven. So I think I went back and bought five to make it at least, you know chronological and just missing one and two but anyway that's that's my harry potter story next we have the terry pratchett section except uh i haven't read any of the terry pratchett books i've only read good omens so let's start with good omens shall we good omens is a book by terry pratchett and neil gaiman and it's very very good i highly recommend it it's one of my favorite books it's just not on the top shelf because there's no room and i didn't mention earlier because i forgot about it but it's good Y'all, it's real good. I read it, like, a couple of years ago, but it's good. I need to reread it soon. So I didn't know what kind of order these Terry Pratchett books went in, so I just kind of put them in a random order. So the first one is Guards, Guards. The next one is Mort. Now, I've actually heard really good things about this from my friend who lent it to me and then stopped being my friend and then never came and got the book back. And eventually I will read it because it did sound very interesting. It just has that friend attached to it right now. And that's just kind of keeping me from reading it right now. Next is The Light Fantastic, which I think has a pretty cool cover. Like the sun and the moon on this book thing look pretty cool. And like, I don't know, that seems like an exciting read. Next is Night Watch, which also has an interesting cover. Look at those brass knuckles, and I don't know what the thing on top is supposed to be. And to conclude my random assortment of Terry Pratchett books that I've gotten from friends, that's literally where I've gotten them is from friends. Some of them I just relate to one friend that isn't my friend anymore. The other I relate to a friend that moved away. Anyway, we have The Thief of Time as the last one, and look at that. That's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool cover, too. Terry Pratchett, you have, like, minimalist, but pretty cool covers. I, I like that about you. Next, we have the Hunger Games series. The first book is The Hunger Games. The second book, and probably my favorite, is Catching Fire. I don't know if Catching Fire is my favorite, because the Catching Fire movie is my favorite, and I haven't read these books in a while. But uh, uh, Catching Fire was pretty good. Up when they got to the games it was pretty boring before then but like you know the games were great and I love Fennec so Catching Fire is probably my favorite and finally we have Mockingjay next we have all of John Green's books starting with my favorite even though it's only four star favorite The Fault in Our Stars which I got a signed copy of because I got it the day it came out mine I think is green 
Yep, mine's a green. J. Scribble. Next, we have my least favorite John Green book, which is Looking for Alaska. These were put in no particular order either, which is how I usually try and put them in my fa like rank of favorites. But one, I'm missing Paper Towns, and two, I just kind of was lazy and put them in the order that they were in in the box. So Looking for Alaska is next, and it's my least favorite John Green book. I just... This is definitely like... Maybe, maybe even two and a half stars, but probably three. Next is Will Grayson, Will Grayson, which was written by John Green and David Levithan. And, like, it's probably my second favorite John Green book. Because, and it's also, like, four stars, I guess. But, like, you know, it's good, but it's not, like, amazing. And the good parts, I don't think, are John Green's parts. I used to have Paper Towns, but since I, my mom stole my copy of Paper Towns to read before the movie came out. The last book on my shelf is An Abundance of Catherines, which is, like, probably my second to least favorite John Green book and probably still three stars. Uh, I don't hate it as much as I hate Looking for Alaska, but, like, I don't like it that much. It's kind of boring and weird. I haven't read it in a while, but, yeah. Next, we have my third shelf which com is comprised... I'm not going to pull these out, y'all. That would be too much work for books that I don't care about. But we have we have my dog books right here. Uh, if you can't read this one, this one says three stories you can read to your dog. And on this little stack over here, we have... A bunch of random shit, honestly. We have, like, we have The Book Thief, which I asked for for Christmas before the the movie came out, and then I never read it, and I still haven't read it, and I need to, because I hear it's really good. We have a, the Backstage Handbook, which I needed because, you know, it's, like, the go-to book for anything technical theater related. Then we have The Woman in Black and the Witch of Edmonton, which I had to buy for class, and then just kept. And then we have the shittiest copy of the Iliad known to man. Uh, I'm not going to pull it out and show you all the things that are wrong with it. I'm just going to let you imagine what's wrong with it. It's terrible, and I hate it. Then we have Agatha Christie, Murder on the Orient Express. I don't know if you can see the murder part, but yeah, Murder on the Orient Express. Uh, I got this as part of a Doctor Who-themed Christmas present, and... I haven't read it yet, but, you know, maybe one day I will. Then also we have this little book that my friend made me called Why You're So Awesome. We have some other bookmarks. This other one is a Doctor Who bookmark. It says it's bigger on the inside. And then we have all of my playbills, which I am going to show you. So, I'm only going to show you the Broadway signed ones. This is a lot. I'm not going to show you every single one of these. First, we have Amelie. Uh... I don't remember which one is Philippa Sue's signature, but I know it's one of these. I think it might be this one. I think it's this one. And honestly, this was a great show, and critics just don't know what they're talking about because it was a great show, and I thoroughly enjoyed seeing it. And also Philippa Sue's signature! Then we have Kinky Boots. I saw the version with Killian Donnelly as Charlie, I believe the character's name is. The main character. That's not the one in the boots. If you've seen Kinky Boots, you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, and so I saw him as that character. But he did not come out for Stage Door, so he did not sign my playbill. But uh, other members of the cast did, and I appreciated them because they were great, too. So that's my Kinky Boots playbill. My favorite playbill is my Spring Awakening playbill because almost literally every member of the cast signed this playbill except for Andy Minatis, or however you pronounce his last name. Uh, yeah, he was the only one who didn't sign it, and this production remains one of my favorite productions that I've ever seen. It comes in only behind the West End production of Les Mis, which is saying something, because one, Les Mis is my favorite show, and two, it was on the fucking West End. Uh, 
which if you don't know is the Broadway circuit in London. They just don't call it Broadway because it's not Broadway. Uh, and then, so this was on Broadway for a couple of weeks and it was just astounding. So it was Deaf West's production of Spring Awakening. And so half the actors were deaf and half the characters were deaf. Most of the characters were deaf. Uh, and like everybody, but the main character, uh, but he's not the main character. There are multiple main characters, but the main character, Melchior, was not deaf, and he was the like the only one that wasn't. So that was really interesting. And they used sign language as part of the choreography. And yeah, it was just fucking amazing. And I wish I could see it again. Then we have School of Rock, which I think I got most of the cast's signature on. I don't know where Sierra Bogus' signature is, but I know she signed this because I also have a picture with her. So like... It's somewhere on here. I just don't know where. And finally, we have my Lame is Playbill from seeing it on the West End. I didn't get a lot of signatures because it was raining, but I did get Rob Houchins, which is this one. Uh, he is my favorite Marius so far. I love him so much. And then we also have Jean Valjean's signature, whose name I've forgotten, but you know, he was great too. So, yeah, honestly, this was, this was my favorite production that I've ever seen. It was just truly astounding. And I wish I'd gotten more signatures, but like I said, it was raining and I was really only there for Rob Houchin's signature and he was leaving. And so, like, I had to catch him while he was leaving and, like, not a lot of people came out because it was raining. So, you know, I had to take what I could get. And that is my bookshelf. I... Hope you enjoyed this bookshelf tour. I finally found a way to make it work. And I'll see you guys in the next video.